Good afternoon. My name is Tom Beaker, and I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Nebraska History Museum on the third Thursday of each month. A detailed schedule of this series, as well as information about historical society activities and programs, can be find, found on our website, www.nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for the funding for funding the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Our presenter today is Gail Cording. Originally from the Norfolk area, she earned a doctorate in history from Kent State University. Gayla became curator of government records for the Historical Society in 2008 and is presently the state archivist. Her program today is entitled York County Progress, 1870 to 1890, The Drama. And we'll focus on some interesting discoveries she made while organizing 19th century York County records. Gayla. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, before I start officially on my presentation, I do have um, thanks to give to three NSHS staff members who were very um, helpful in pre getting this presentation ready to go. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Del Darling, who is part of our digital imaging lab, who scanned a lot of the images and documents that you will see in this PowerPoint presentation today. Uh, to Marty Miller, one of our reference staff who assisted me in identifying some images from our county photo collection for use in this presentation. And finally, who's in the audience today, Kelly Bacon and our Historic Preservation Department, who helped me with some county poor farm information uh, regarding York County. So I'd like to thank all of them for their assistance with this particular PowerPoint. Uh, before I really begin going into this, I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of background as to how this presentation came about and what I actually ended up finding. Uh, late last year, I was organizing some records for the York County District Court uh, late last year, and I had pretty much gotten done with that particular project, was about ready to update um, an inventory listing. And I thought, well, let me look up on the shelving units. And I look up, and we have tier levels in the government records facility where I lurk, work. And I noticed four bankers' boxes sitting on the very top shelf with the following, you know, crude label on them. It said, York County Clerk, Miscellaneous Files, circa 1870 to 1930. Being a very organized person, I don't like the, the word miscellaneous at all. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, I've already organized these district court records. I will just go ahead, take these boxes down, and I'll organize them you know, quickly. I thought it would take me two to three weeks tops. Wouldn't take me much longer than that. That is not what happened. <laughs> I took down the boxes, opened up the lids, and what I discovered were tightly wound bundles of paper in each box that I had to end up unraveling each piece of paper and then organizing it. My three-week project took about three months for me to get done. But this is sort of the result, and I, I started to talk to Tom Beaker and said, well, I found some just really interesting documents on some late 19th century York County history I thought would make a good brown bag, and that, that's what it turned out to be. So that's what I'm sharing with you today. And um, I'm going to try to place a lot of these uh, documentations or these records into larger so social, political, and economic contents, not only for what's going on regionally, locally, but also even in a national context for you. Uh, the one caveat I will 
give to you right now or provide to you is that I am not an expert in York County. I'm originally from Pierce County, but I did do quite a bit of reading in York County history, so hopefully I'll be able to answer some of the, any questions that you have at the following of the presentation. I did sort of expand this a little bit because some of the photographs that we found were more from like the early 1900s to kind of document what I said, but let me get started here. Just to give you a very brief background into the settlement of York County, uh, it was evidenced by 1855. Uh, there was a charter of a proposed town, Lawrence, but apparently that was never developed. Uh, it was officially organized in April of 1870. Uh, the census cited an entire population of about 640 people, 576 square miles. Uh, the town of York is obviously the county seat. It was platted in 1869. Now, this is what was interesting. I thought, sure, you'd be able to tell me right off the bat what how York County got the origin of its name. There seems to be some controversy of that in some of the early histories of the county. Um, some people thought it might have been or after York in England. Um, the majority of people, or at least the people in the residence at the time, thought, well, it's probably named after either a connection with York County or people who may have immigrated from York County in Pennsylvania. So there's two conflicting views as to how York County name originated. But just to give you an idea of what the population looks like in the growth according to the censuses for the state, in 1880 the population of York County was a little over 11,000. Uh, by 1900 uh, York County's population was about a little over 18,000, so it was growing. Just to give an idea, uh, when this goes probably up on YouTube, just to know where York is situated at, um, we are just very close to Lancaster County here. It is just west, uh, a couple of a couple of areas, but I thought I wanted a nice colorful map to give you an idea of where it was located at. The other thing I wanted to point out was this is an 1889 map showing a lot of the precincts and townships. Uh, I will be talking about railroad development, particularly through the York uh, city, town of York, and you can see where the railroad runs. It's just right, actually, in the, almost in the middle uh, of the county. But I will be talking about some of these townships and some of these precincts a little bit later in the presentation, but I wanted to give you an idea of where these were officially located. Now, this was one of the documents I found. I don't know when this dates to. There is a name on the back of the document, but you can see how fragile it is. I wanted uh, Del Darling, our digital imaging specialist, to really do this in the original format. I didn't want him to touch it up because I think people need to understand these documents do get very fragile over time, and they darken and they become brittle. Uh, this appears to be a crude, hand-drawn plat map. Uh, it did have a name and it did say York in the back. There was no date to it, but it seems to be pretty much close to this time frame just from the touch and the feel of the paper. Um, it does list the directional, but what I noticed is it has the railroad running through, so I'm assuming this is the town of York at the time. And it also lists uh, people who own property. And if you look really carefully at it, you will see that there are um, little placement maps where schools and maybe churches are in this plat map at all as well. But I thought it was just a neat document. Now this is sort of the crux of what uh, my presentation is today. If, I think in a 30-year time frame, as this county starts to experience a rise in population and as business and industry start to develop in the communities in York County, uh, so does the need for what I refer to as modern amenities. I think the records that I'm going to be showing you illustrate the growth of this area from sort of a western frontier region to a region that has really a tax infrastructure that supports its citizenry. And then you start to see a lot of rules and ordinances being passed by the county board, of what we would call commissioners here in Lancaster County. At, for that time period, they were known as the county board of supervisors. Railroad expansion is the first thing that really starts to hit York County. The first railroad line 
was of Burlington and Missouri. It reached the town of York in the fall of 1877. I think once again it reflects re reflected growing community interest, business interest growing. And the one thing that I started to find, and I found a number of these, not only from this time period, some of them I found go up to about 1930. These are sample assessment values for property for railroad lines and other businesses that are associated with the railroad lines. These are involving tax levies and bonds. They have had to pay a certain amount of money for property in those areas. And I wanted to show you what the Burlington Depot looked like going through York and we found a series of three images of them. I'm assuming these are probably from the early 1900s. But it shows the Burlington Depot itself. And then it has some shots kind of going just, uh, the train just going out of the depot. I'd love to have that one area in large. It looks like a young, a young lady walking there. I'm curious to see what she's dressed like. And then it's just going out. But here are three samples of what you found. These were known as railroad right-of-ways. This would have been approved by what's known as the Auditor of Public Accounts. We would know it now as the State Auditor's Office. And for this one, it's the Nebraska Railway Company. And it is stating that it's personal property belonging to the corporation and right of way and depot grounds assessed at the rate of $5,445 per mile for a total of a little over 68,000 miles. And here's another one from 1890. Once again, it's, it's interest belonging to the railroad and communications. And obviously, that would have been before telephones. This would have been the telegraph. And this is the Western Union telegraph. And uh, they're saying that they have $65.26 for their miles of telegraph lines, and they don't really specify how many miles there are of it. And then it gives a total amount at the very end here. It's a little over $3,000. And one that a lot of people know in regards to railroads and railroad companies is the Pullman Palace Car Company. Not a lot of money, apparently. Uh, they're their worth for what we have for tax levies here, or what they're assessed at, is $12.49 per mile. Other fantastic document I found was a census, and it's in a bound volume, very fragile condition, uh, but it's actually a statistical census. There are no names in it, but it's from 1879, and there were a number of things in it. Um, but I just wanted to highlight a few of, of the items within it. Um, they went through each particular township and county, um, county town and listed, for example, what the occupation of was everybody in that particular township. Well, in this case, you'll see that the majority of them, 182, are farmers. They have a listing of five as newspaper editors. Three are ministers, and then one is, I believe, a physician. And so it's a total of 191 just for that particular page. This, I thought, was absolutely <coughs> fascinating. This is a very detailed census on the causes of death in each particular township. And you can see here, it's really hard to read, but I think you're seeing Baker, West Blue, Stewart, um, looks like it looks like it looks like Bear Creek. I might be incorrect on that. Uh, the majority of the deaths in a lot of the precincts were from diphtheria, and you'll see that particularly I think in the Baker precinct. So there must have been an outbreak of diphtheria in that particular t community at that time. But there were like several pages of this, and I just had Dell do one particular scan of the page just so you have an idea. But uh, someone asked me if there was any names of residents in there. No, it is primarily a statistical census. But for a statistical census from 1879, it is very, very accurate and very detailed. Other thing you start to see uh, as we move into the tw early 20th century, more need for 
particularly just paved or graveled roads. And as any business does, as they saw this booming, you will have a number of businesses plying their trade and sending brochures and ads to particularly the uh, York County Board of Commissioners so they would approve funding for this. One I found was a great ad, and this was from the Morrison Brothers. Uh, they were situated in Fort Madison in Iowa and it's talking about various plows and road graders. This is from 1890. And then here's the second part of their grade saying, please pick us to be your road grading, road scraper business <laughs> for your roads. Other great one I found also out of Iowa was bids for construction. A lot of bridges being built, particularly railroad trestles. Um, and the one I thought was very ornate for the for the time period was one from the King Iron Bridge and Manufacturing Company. They were from Des Moines, Iowa, and they mm. said that they would erect bridges for $5 and $85 per lineal feet. Other fantastic thing, I found very early lists for members of the fire department for York. Now the fire department in the town of York itself started in 1883 mm -hmm. and they ended up having two stations between 1883 and 1945. One station was in the northern part of York and the second station was apparently by a near an underpass of some kind. But this was a li one listing from 1892 of the uh, people who were part of the fire department at the time. And um, it also said in this particular order that, you know, they were exempt from jury duty or some other duties because if, if there was a fire in town, they had to respond to that. I think I found another one a couple years later from 1894. Love this one. A lot of starting to be health and safety ordinances being passed by the County Board of Supervisors. And this is one, this was a request by a citizen in the county. They wanted in the city of York, Block 75, 1884. They were requesting a grading. They thought it had stagnant water. It was becoming a health hazard. So they are see, saying, can we get funds for someone to come in and grade this so it will no longer be a health hazard to the community. This is my, probably one of my favorites that I found. Very early, leash law from 1889, and it's just to the County Board of Supervisors again, and it's stating we are upset with the fact that we have a lot of basically feral uh, dogs running around the community. Uh, from now on, we would like our residents to have a leash or a collar around them with a nameplate that identifies who the owner of the pet is. And this is, I love this, I love this image. I'm so glad when we found this in the county photo collection. It obviously a little bit later, probably early 1900s, but it is the leash law. It is obviously being served by the postmaster at the time, it was C.W. Shrek. And it just says on the lower level, postmaster C.W. Shrek and his guard. So I don't know what the dog's name was, but I think that is just a marvelous image. Other thing that begins to happen over time as the population grows, uh, York has decided that they would like to get a need for more qualified and basically certification for teachers for uh, educating their children. And this is a letter actually dated fairly early in regards to this, and I cannot remember who wrote this. It may have been one of the county attorneys. And he is stating that we really almost need a, what was called a normal school at the time. And a normal school was basically like a two-year educational program to train and educate teachers to go out into the community. And it's quite early. Didn't happen quite there then yet. Um, you don't see the normal uh, school or the normal college for York being developed until about 1901. And I'll go into that, to that in just a little bit. But what I did find was this. In most cases, if you were certified as a teacher in the county, you usually took a number of exams, and you had to pass those exams in order to teach. And usually this was done through the county superintendent of schools. And in this case, this was an individual named E.S. Franklin. And I found two very large bound bundles of 
these, and they were applications of certificates, third quarter, 1888, uh, involving teacher applications, and this was in for one school district, number 73. And I wanted the, the scan to be in this detail to show you how brittle this paper is, but here's what's in it. This is just one individual. There's a number of them if you just go through them, and they're not in any order, but this individual, there's a teacher application. He's taken the courses um, that the county requires, so he's asking for a certificate now to teach and what, he's, uh, what, he's, uh, what his abilities are to teach and what grades he can teach. So this is his application. His name is Ernest Carter. He's 24 years old. He gives a very brief idea of where he's from in the county. Uh, what grade he's uh, primarily taught and would like to teach, and that's the third grade. And then he gives just a little bit of his background where he has, has taught before in some capacity. <coughs> now, there was a business school and a normal school in York, Nebraska. It actually was not founded until the summer of 1901. Uh, they usually held classes on the second floor at 511 Lincoln Avenue, and then they eventually met in this particular building, which is right at the very top. It's named the Nobes Opera House, and then they moved to the York College campus in 1925. And my understanding was is that they had two programs. One was like a one-year program where you would just get basic classes and certification, and if you literally wanted to go on for what we would consider a bachelor's in education, that was a two-year program and much more intensive. Now, <laughs> I called it growing pains because I, 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 this, this was interesting. I started to unravel all these pieces of paper and what did I find? There were a few prior to this and even after this, but something happened in from 1889 to 1890. I found gobs of these. They were basically property tax protests. And a lot of them, they're just like someone took a little scrap of paper, took it on the edge, and then just ripped it off. But this is what they look like. I only took three samples of these. I probably have a folder approximately three inches of this, of what happened here. And I'll give you, show you these a little bit later and what they did, but I did, I think, piece together what happened here. Uh, it's a little complicated uh, to understand. I believe what happened was uh, they had had Nebraska revised statutes in 1881. Well, by 1888, they revised a lot of the statutes for a lot of the county offices, and I believe this involved the treasurers and the assessors. I don't think it was a, a big change, but it was enough that apparently either assessors or treasurers were misunderstanding what they were supposed to do in assessing property. And I believe that's what caused this. But you saw a lot of these, and they're just very brief. And I, I love this one, uh, and this one's a little more formal. I hereby complain of the assessment on lots 3 uh, dash 4, 45 in block number 32 in New York addition to the city of York and ask that the same be reduced the, to an equitable amount. Jesse Love. <laughs> Here's another one. This is by a grocery, a, a grocers, and they're saying the same thing. This one's a little harder to read. I can't remember. It looks like John Stodder, but he's also complaining that his property taxes are just too high. And this wouldn't have gone through the County Board of Supervisors. It would have been what we do here in Lancaster County. It would go to the County Board of Equalization. But uh, someone said, well, how did they finally handle this? Um, this is where it got really interesting and, and almost controversial. Um, all of a sudden, these County Board of Equalization members are writing very formal letters to the county assessor and to the county treasurers, basically saying, what is going on? We're being inundated by property tax protests by the citizens of York County. And of course, you see the county treasurer and the county assessor trying to defend what, they're getting very defensive in the letters, even though they're very formally written, saying, well, this is how we're interpreting the laws. Well, it gets better. 
Eventually, this ended up going to the county attorney at the time, and he literally writes a formal opinion about the tax levy laws and how they're supposed to be interpreting them from the state according to these 1888 laws. And eventually it must have calmed down because in the subsequent years after 1890, there were a few property tax protests, but nothing like for that year. Nothing. Like I said it was almost a three inch pile and some of these are just like little scraps of paper. And uh, someone said, well, how did they handle, um, how did the County Board of Equalization handle this? I would say from reading them, 90% of the cases they probably did lower them and, and you will see that because that's why I wanted to bring up the grocers one. You'll see what they did here. It was assessed at $1,500 and this is their writing. They're saying reduce it to $1,400. And in most cases they did reduce them. Not in all, but in the majority of them. This was the one I was talking very extensively with my colleagues about the courthouse construction for the original courthouse at York County. This emerged as incredibly controversial. And I couldn't quite figure it out when I started reading because officially the county officials moved into their offices around, I'd say, latter part of 1888, early 1889. Well, I eventually found that the original contract, which we have, was signed on May 28th, 1881. And I kept thinking to myself, why is it taking almost eight and a half years for the county officials to be moving into the original York County Courthouse? So then I started to piece it together bit by bit. The original contract to build was signed by these two individuals, Charles J. Nobes and William H. B. Stout. I had to figure out who are these individuals. <coughs> Charles J. Nobes is probably very well known in York County to this day. He uh, was uh, originally born and raised in Illinois. His father was a immigrant from Ireland who had been a ship's carpenter. But Nobes eventually was the deputy warden for the Illinois State Penitentiary and um, eventually he became the warden for the Nebraska State Penitentiary from 1880 to 1886. He eventually must have liked the York area a lot because eventually he settled there. He, uh, by the time he's out of being the state uh, penitentiary warden, uh, he then owns a farm loan company in York and eventually raises like what I heard is trotting horses. And he is actually uh, buried in Greenwood Cemetery in York. He died in 1897, uh, and his wife died, Helen, uh, died about a, a decade later. So that's Charles J. Nobes. Then I wondered, well, who's William H. B. Stout? Well, I found a lot of information from him uh, by Jim McKee in an article from the Lincoln Journal Star that was published on December 20th, 2009. You still can access it online if you probably type this in, WHB Stout. Uh, no man has done more for Lincoln. Uh, Stout was born in Rome, Ohio uh, in 1837, and he moved to DeSoto, Nebraska in 1858, eventually passes away in 1902. But he was known for being a realtor, very, very interested in real estate development. And uh, Stout won a contract to finance or build what would be the Nebraska State Penitentiary in 1870. <coughs> but here's where it gets interesting. They employed convicts to do this at 42 cents per day to do the actual construction. And then that's when it hit me. Because I, then I went back to the original York County contract from 1881. Here's what it says, quote, penal sum of $10,000. Then I realized it was convict prison labor that built the York County Courthouse. This was also substantiated in an 1886 biennial report to what would be the state auditor's office. They had appropriated to the warden, Nobes, of the state pen $12.65. Since. So this is six months. It's a biennial report. That means they paid convict labor eight cents a day to build the York, original York County Courthouse. <coughs> then, once I figured this out, I ran into another dilemma with the original York County Courthouse. And th this is really interesting. 
The architect who was in charge of the design of the York County Courthouse was an individual named O.H. Placey. Uh, Placey was originally from Chicago, but he ended up settling in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, he was the architect for the it is still there, the Washington County Courthouse in Blair, Nebraska. Uh, he was also um, built the, or the architect for the Adams County Courthouse, and this is in Quincy, Illinois. However, this one did not last. It was destroyed by a tornado in 1945, and as I will show you, he's known for his Romanesque or Greek Revival style to his architecture. But this, this is really good. He wrote a three-page letter to the County Board of Supervisors basically complaining of shoddy work on the York County Courthouse. And he's really complaining to the County Board about the site supervisor whose name was W.B. Howard. Here is the letter, and this gets interesting. Placey apparently is an architect, he's very well educated, but notice if you start reading the letter and it's a little difficult to read, he's a phonetic speller. He also uses the inappropriate word forms for certain words. I'm a former English teacher. This drives me crazy. <laughs> but notice the word he's using, honorable, H-O-N-O-R-B-E-L, uh, very third line down. To the Honorable Board of Supervisors, gentlemen, I submit the following report. Your architect cannot, even cannot is spelled right. He only uses one N cannot accept. It should be A-C-C, -C, not E-X-C-E-P-T. <laughs> so it, it goes on and on like this. He's, he's complaining about the painting isn't done in certain session. The window sashes are not hung right. There's an issue with the building's foundation. He is, he is not a happy camper. Let's put it that way. And it even gets better on the second page. Notice he's saying, this is so unacceptable. I think the site contractor should be charged for this. And these are the list of itemized deductions <laughs> for what he should be doing. Uh, this is just not acceptable work. And then he goes very on to say, um, I just simply cannot price and accept each part of the parcel of it, this, whereas said building is not an even the word complete, it's P-L-E-A-T, rather E-T-E, is not complete. I cannot, once again, wrong form of accept of said building and do justice to the county. Respectfully yours, O.H. Placey, architect and superintendent. <laughs> and I, I really was just almost, it, it's, it's very humorous, but you can see he's very upset with the work. He thinks it is not up to standards. And eventually the Board of Supervisors writes a letter, a formal letter to the site contractor, O.H. Howard, saying what is going on? Our architect is complaining about your work. It is shoddy. It's, it's not done correctly. I did not find a letter written back from Howard um, addressing the complaints about the work, workmanship on the courthouse. Um, so I'm not sure exactly. They must have eventually resolved it or they came to some sort of agreement because at a certain point, county officials do begin to move into the building and start to use it. This is very light, but you can tell they are not happy. I found this. This is the courthouse furniture cost for each department. Uh, county Board of Commissioners, the Clerk of the Court, the County Treasurers, these are their desks, their judges, uh, judges' chamber tables, their chairs. Um, so it gives you an itemized list of how much their furniture or their um, furniture costs for, their, for each of their offices. I thought that was very interesting. The other thing that I found were these. There were a number of, once again, uh, tradesmen trying to, you know, sell to the county, please buy. They knew they needed vaults and safes, so a number of dealers were giving a lot of, uh, you know, their promotional brochures to buy their safes and their, <laughs> their vaults for the county courthouse, particularly for the judges' chambers. This is the one they eventually went with. This was the Hall Safe and Lock Company. Uh, they were out of Chicago, but I believe the reason they chose them is because they had a dealer in Omaha, so it was cheaper to uh, ship that particular vault. Now, there were a number of these safe brochures. It was 13 through 17. The other ones, I think, were too fragile, and Dell decided probably not to scan those. They actually didn't go with the, lo there's the low end to the high end, 13's the low end, 17's the high end sort of safe. 
or, or bald. And uh, they went with the middle one, which was number 14, which is not shown here, a little bit fancier than this one. And I actually still have the original invoice for the shipment of number 14 safe to one of the judge's chambers. Um, it was a total of $516 and some odd cents when it was shipped from Omaha. And that was the total amount. It gets better. <laughs> it gets better. I was trying to find more information about W.B. Howard, and I never really did find a lot about the site contractor's background, but I did find uh, that he was mentioned in a Nebraska Supreme Court case from September 1890 that involved the York County Courthouse. And he literally testified in this particular case. Now, this was between John Fitzgerald versus A. A. Richardson. Literally what this came down to, it was a contract dispute. Fitzgerald, who is uh, pictured here, was an Irish immigrant who settled in Lincoln. He became very wealthy for commercial ventures, and he was the owner of the Lincoln Brick and Tile Company. And uh, John, uh, Jim McKee did a, um, article on him and it is still available online. I was able to pull it up and just to show you how well to do he was, this was his mansion. Uh, this was on South, I think South 20th and D Street. It was uh, demolished a number of years ago, but you can see how ornate this was. Um, Richardson, on the other hand, was a dealer. He was a middleman for companies and had entered into a contract agreement that he stated with Fitzgerald. Uh, he normally received a commission for bricks sold to construction projects, and it was 50 cents per 1,000 bricks. For this case, he was claiming that he had not received his commission for construction projects involving the York County Courthouse and a construction project in Hastings, Nebraska. And he, Howard, um, testified at the very end of this trial that he did not even know Mr. Richardson, that the only dealings that he had ever dealt with was Mr. Fitzgerald, the owner of Lincoln Brick and Tile Company. So he really did not know much about this contract dispute. To make a long story short, the ruling uh, for the Supreme Court justices did rule in favor of Richardson, but for a lower amount than what he was claiming. Uh, the initial claim was for around $365. He received, and the total amount was $168.83. The justices stated that Richardson was the dealer in the projects um, and the middleman, but had overestimated the amount of brick used in the construction of both building projects provided the numbers by both of the site contractors so that he had overestimated how much brick had actually been used and that was he wasn't allowed for the full amount for $365. But just to show you what the York County Courthouse looked like when it was finished, uh, it was built in 1886 for around $60,000. Uh, I, I think it was a very impressive structure. It was built on the square. I think this is a marvelous overhead image of it from the early 1900s. Um, a lot of architectural details on it as well, and it was eventually remodeled in 18, 1953 for $45,000. And this is another earlier view, and this is the one that I think was used in the brochure. And I think the brochure, it was in color, and it really showed you a lot of the ornate details on this particular courthouse. But unfortunately, time progresses, and the fate of the courthouse, uh, the original courthouse in York, Early 1970s, officials, county officials pretty much decided that the courthouse had pretty much run its day. It was becoming cost ineffective uh, to maintain it, and that happens with older buildings. Uh, this was debated and contested by some members of the community who thought that, no, we should not get rid of this building or use it for something else. In fact, I even ran across a 1978 study that was done in coordination with the Nebraska State Historical Society for like renovating um, the HVAC system in the original courthouse. And the conclusion was by an outside consultant that to do that, even at that time frame when energy costs were very low, was extremely expensive. Um, 
they thought it was probably solved with this. In 1976, the courthouse was added to the National Register of Historic Places. However, I did confirm this with our Director of Historic Preservation, which is Bob Puschendorf. A listing on the National Register does not place property restrictions on private property rights or political subdivisions. It is still up to that individual or business or county agency to determine what's in the best interest for that property. And of course, what eventually ended up happening from about 78 to 80, the, court, the original courthouse was raised and a new one was built. Economic impacts um, that I thought were very interesting. <clears throat> And a lot of these actually are national events that do have a very regional impact on York County itself. And this has gotten some attention um, in some uh, television broadcasts that I've noticed. Um, and one was the invasion of the Rocky Mountain locust, basically a grasshopper invasion that occurred. And this is what sparked this. And this ended up really affecting a lot of the Midwest and even some of the uh, Northwestern states. Uh, this really started in the mid-1870s, particularly in, the, in Colorado. And this eventually was a, literally a plague that moved um, eastward. Usually, when grasshoppers laid their eggs, they, they do them in pods and they're kind of underneath the soil. Well, usually in Colorado and those types of states, they get a lot of moisture and a lot of rain at a certain time of year. And when they get all this rain, it's like a natural pesticide. It's a natural way for it to control the population of grasshoppers because it kills off a lot of the eggs that they, they laid. Well, that didn't happen in the mid-1870s. Colorado experienced a major drought for a number of years. And so there was no natural, basically, pesticide for these grasshoppers. So when they laid their eggs, they just started to do a swath of destruction and just started to go eastward. And I did find this estimate by the U.S. Entomological Commission. They estimated the ag losses in 1874 alone, and this is throughout the United States, at 56 million for that time frame. They said that was the low end. Some of them thought it might be closer to 100 million. But I did find in York County that this invasion of grasshoppers or this Rocky Mountain locust occurred by about 1876 and I found a note uh, for July 20th from the Old Settlers History of York County and I'm going to read this out to you and the, and the uh, subset uh, in the booklet is Calamity of Grasshoppers. In the afternoon of a hot day, July the 20th, 1876, a mysterious cloud appeared in the northern horizon, and all were wondering what it was until suddenly the awful cloud of grasshoppers covered the country, so thick at times that the sun was darkened and all the gardens and green vegetation was soon devoured. Much of the small grain was in its shock and mostly saved to the great comfort of the pioneer settlers. The grain that was standing was soon ruined, and the grasshoppers would bite off the straw off just below the head. After they had done all the damage they could, they could, they filled the egg ground with eggs and left. The next spring, the eggs began hatching and the settlers were filled with alarm with the coming crops and every device imaginable was made for catching the young grasshoppers. And this is where I found this. A petition was filed with the County Board of Supervisors asking them to take measures to exterminate the young grasshoppers. The County Board met in a special session on April 25th, 1875 and this is what they did. Uh, they literally paid two dollars per bushel. Uh, so if you found a device to capture them, you would bring them to the, they would collect them at the courthouse and then they would burn them. And this is the first page of this original petition that I found to destroy the young grasshoppers. They're pleading with the York County Board of Commissioners to please do something and this is where you see this petition being signed and that's where they paid for uh, to capture and then burn these young grasshoppers. Um, the good news is by 1880, the grasshopper invasion did stop. There was a shift in weather patterns, uh, and so heavier rains and colder conditions, and that eventually did stop it. And uh, the Rocky Mountain locust itself became extinct, I think, by about the 1920s in the United States, so we no longer they were coming in. 
But as we know, living in Nebraska, weather conditions change very often. And by the 1890s, another drought occurred, a severe one that affected the entire state of Nebraska. And what I found in York, when I found an, a number of samples of these from 1895, they were relief potatoes given to families by bushels in York County. And I'll give you an example of scan up from one area. Now this was, ref like I said, reflective, this entire severe drought throughout the state of Nebraska. And I was going to point out this record group. We assign numbers and record groups to every collection we have. This is RG33. Um, this is a very underutilized collection. That's why I wanted to bring it to your attention. It's four boxes. It's called the Nebraska State Relief Commission, was actually formed to help with this severe drought from 1891 to 95. Uh, we have a number of county reports, supply distributions, trying to help citizens throughout the state of Nebraska that were severely hit by this drought. And here's what the one looks like. It's from 1895, it's for the West Blue Township. It gives you the name of who received um, the bushels of potatoes. It was a little over two pounds usually, and who was the person or the representative from that particular community that provided them. And it looks like from the very bottom here, it looks like you could also pick up some potatoes from the post offices in certain towns like Cordova. Looks like Cordova's mentioned here a lot. Now, the other thing that it tended to occur as the conditions became worse, um, and of course there's no such thing as federal subsidies or any sort of welfare assistance at that time, is the development of poor farms. You just became, you had people who became literally destitute. Now, in York County, there was talk to actually develop more of an organized poor farm much earlier, which I'll get into, but that doesn't occur quite by 1880s. What I found is that they contracted out with individuals. So if there was somebody in need in that particular community, they would usually hire out or contract someone to help that particular, that particular group or particular individuals. And I found one great example from February of 1880. And this was given under the care of a woman named Melissa Campbell. This is what it looks like. There's not a lot of information in here, but it does list the names of the individuals who were receiving help, their ages, um, and just how long they received help, and even what the uh, funds that the board paid or for the county, what they paid to give to them, uh, and even when they left. Now you'll notice there's a family at the very end, I can, it looks like Slavin, and there's a number of children. One's only, I think there's one named age nine, 10, and there's only one. It doesn't really say but eventually they do leave the care of Melissa Campbell. It doesn't really state what happened, but it does tell you that they, uh, this woman was in care of these particular individuals and, and when. Now, development of poor farms actually began fairly early in the United States. The first poor one was developed in Philadelphia in 1773. Uh, development in York County is not until probably the latter half of the 1890s. I did find a letter written by one of the county attorneys actually asking or requesting a formal poor farm to be developed, and I believe that was from 1892, but it looks like they did not develop until 1898, and there were two of them that actually lasted until 1948 in York County. There were two poor farms. Um, one was about three miles east of York, uh, and the other one was actually part of the county fairgrounds. And this is where I have to thank Kelly Bacon, my colleague. She actually plotted those on a map. She's done a lot of um, background information on poor farms um, in the state of Nebraska. And this is where they were located in York County. Uh, I didn't, was then able to find an image of it. I was hoping I could find an image of the, the poor farms, but I couldn't. However, it tells you something that York County's poor farms lasted till 1948. Um, what I found in subsequent documents is that they contracted usually people who were in the poor farms to help with various jobs in the community. Usually those were farm related. They did receive medical care. A physician was assigned to go out and do health checks. Uh, the food supplies were inventoried, I found out, and there was an annual 
uh, reports that were documented by what was a superintendent of the county poor farm. Now the earliest one I was able to find was a man named Fletcher Deal, but there were subsequent ones, but I found a few of these annual reports within this collections. Um, most poor farms in the United States closed down by the late 1920s due to abuses and very unhealthy, unsanitary living conditions. Uh, it just was not a good situation. So a lot of times they would have very young and very old put together, had severely mentally ill, uh, being um, exposed to people who had contagious diseases. So it was not, not a good good area but apparently Yorks County seems to be fairly well run and it lasted till 1948. Um, that's kind of the end of what I had for just sort of these like treasures from the collections that I found uh, within these documents. I did want to give you some resources to consult if you're interested in um, any of the documents that I presented to you today or even any of the images. I did want to plug our reference research room that is located in our first floor at 1500 R Street. This is on UNL's campus. It's next to the Student Union Building. Our hours are from Tuesday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and Saturday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. I've also given you their phone number and their email reference if you would like to ask about any of these documents that I presented or anything in revolving York County. Um, second thing I will tell you about our reference research room, uh, we have a number of histories of York County in there and a lot, of, a lot of the counties in Nebraska. We have mostly newspapers and marriages on microfilm from all Nebraska uh, counties. And I will warn you, if you notice something in one of the documents that I showed today and that you're interested in observing or want to, want to look at, um, you need to have that risk request that record to be pulled from the York County Collection, which is Record Group 246, and I'll show you a link to this in a little bit. Uh, these records are located in an off-site facility, and I need about 24 to 48 hours in order to pull any records. So if you see something and you say, oh, I want to see that, that uh, page about Melissa Campbell and the poor County Poor Farm, um, I cannot pull that today. I would have to pull it in a subsequent time frame. So just note that. And the other thing I wanted to point out, we do have a York County finding aid. A finding aid is a listing of what is in the collections, and we have them for all counties. So this will tell you what we have for records in that particular county, and I did update the finding aid to show you these particular documents, or at least give you files to know where these documents are located. Uh, but that is all I, I have for today. Uh, thank you very much for attending. I appreciate it.